You could be wiser as an educated advisor. Hello everyone, I'm Steve Savant, syndicated financial columnist and money color commentator. On today's show, historical views on longevity, part one of our series on the mortality revolution, all here on Let's Get Down to Business. I've been speaking on the mortality revolution, I mean, maybe 25 years of my 35 years, and I wanted to talk to you today about a little bit of a historical viewpoint, kind of give an oversee and see what you think about the progress we've made since at least the beginning of what we know as civilized history. It's kind of short and sweet, and I want to be able to walk through some of the ideas of the past old timers and where the numbers are today in relationship to maybe this, like I said, this timeline on history. There's a period in the uh, world called the Antediluvian period. Uh, most of this is in the book of Genesis. Some of this, we have some recorded history of the flood, but this is the period before the great flood. Somehow, somewhere, whether you're sacred or secular text, they address this period as the Antediluvian period. We did have some kind of an event, a catastrophic event, and some people believe that the canopy in the, that was surrounding the earth at the time that this big deluge occurred really affected the way our longevity became and it became shorter after the event. But during the uh, antediluvian period, the longest person recorded, at least in the Genesis, the sacred text, is 969 years. Now, he died the year of the flood, but he didn't die because of the flood. A little difference in distinction there. It's probably hard to imagine a person living a millennia. And again, we have some evidence. That there are people that have lived a long time. If you're a big History Channel fan and you've been watching Ancient Aliens, there's a lot of figure facts and figures that maybe those people that are living longer maybe weren't really human. I'll leave that to your judgment. But now look at this. The post-Diluvian period, for our time, after the post-Diluvian period, there's a passage in the Bible, in Book of Genesis, that basically states that maybe man's years will now be about, oh, 120 years now. And that's odd because I've never seen a mark to mark on something in the Bible or something in secular history that says, hey, we think this is where we're going. But keep in mind, this could be very well our years to come. Now, at the apex of the Roman Empire, the actual age for a male in the civilized, well, if you could call it civilized, in the Roman Empire was right around age 25. Now, one of the big reasons this occurred was because it was great military dictatorship, human slavery, and a culture of human devaluation. So the average human male in the Western uh, Europe during uh, Rome's apex of their dominance was about 25 years. Now, during the year, during Ponce de Leon in the 1500s, he's a great explorer, but he was looking in the state of Florida for the great fountain of youth to try to extend his longevity. During Ponce de Leon's time on the earth, the average age for a Western civilized uh, male was about 37 years of age. And then Sir Edmund Haley. Now, you know Sir Edmund as the gentleman, the great scientist that discovered the comet consequently named after him. But what you may not understand about Sir Edmund Haley is he's the first one that constructed a very crude actuarial system to be able to predict life expectancy, and then off of that actuarial table, we have built our life and our annuity tables. Now, remember back in the day, Rome actually was the first one to come up with an annuity, but the real tables that we use today are really basically on the mathematician genius of Sir Edmund Haley. So in the late 1600s, the average European male, again, 46 years. Now, uh, oddly enough, Sir Edmund lived a lot longer than that. Now, when I'm looking at the 1941 CSO, I did not come into the business that would have put me, but if you're in your 80s and you're watching this show and you came into the business, you might, you might have actually sold life and annuities on a 1941 CSO, the Commissioner Standard Operational Table. The average age death for the 1941 was age 62, and they built the Social Security system off the 1941 CSO. So when you're looking at it, the actuarial tables work well if everybody just dies around 62 years of age. Of course, this is all changing, and that's not what's happening today. Look at this gal, Jean Clement from France. She lived 122 years, 164 days. She is the Guinness Book of World Records. Think about living over a century and adding another 22 years. Wow, she had a great diet, and people around her said she was, lived a very good life, and her quality of life because of her relatives and support system was quite well. 122 years, though, that is the Guinness Book of World Records for a documented human. Now, think about this. 
Susanna Jones, I call her old Susanna after the song. She was the last United States tri-centurion. She was born in 1899, lived throughout the entire 20th century, and then died at 116. Think about this. They call some of these gals that are living this long, they call them tri-centurion super centenarian teenagers. Unbelievable. Now, According to Dr. Aubrey de Grey, a man that's huge professor in human longevity in Europe, he says the person that's going to live, the first person that's going to live to 150 years has already been born and on the earth. Now, of course, I don't know how he can say that, but thinking about Jean Clement living to 122 and seeing Susanna Jones live to 116, I mean, 115, it could be in, uh, in the cards. So it's not out there and it's not an extreme view, so to speak. Jan, uh, Jane Aston from Sense and Sensibility said, if you observe people who always live forever, it's probably because they have a annuity to be paid to them. So they don't want to short themselves. It's interesting that people who have pensions, annuities, government, military pensions, and corporate pensions, all these people seem, and, and long social security, they all seem to live longer. It's interesting to note that when you start thinking about this, this is the kind of thing where we're looking at a, a, the history of basic human mortality. You're looking at numbers that to us right now seem to be unbelievable and astonishing. I want to look at this gentleman, Otto von Bismarck from Germany. He was the first person that actually made a pension invented for his people. It was built for people who lived who were living to age 70, and in German population, at the only time that they lived, they were only living to age 48. So if you couldn't collect to your 70, and people are living only till around 48 or so, the system worked well. It's just for those at that time, just for the outliers, the people that were actually breaking off the standard deviation. But look at the big issues of Social Security. In 1945, there were 49.9, workers per beneficiary for Social Security. The leverage of numbers, the, the, the law of large numbers was great. Five years later, it dropped to 16.5. I just want you to think about that. In 1945, it was 41.9. In 1951, or 1950, it was, went down to 16.5 in a short period of five years. By 1960, it dropped to 5.1, and today, it's only 2.8 workers per retiree. So when you're looking at the drop here, workers per benefit on this chart, there is a major drop from 45 to uh, 1950, and then a precipitous half again in 1955, and then it starts dropping. And then it starts slowing down in the 70s, 3.7, 3.2. But you can see, this is not a sustainable system if we don't have enough workers. This is one of the arguments, strictly by math, not by politics, that immigration needs to pl take place in the United States because we don't have the average birth in our normal citizenship. We need to have other people come in and work. We actually have the, one of the lowest um, uh, workforce right now that we've ever had in America. How many workers support the Social Security system? Here's another graph that shows it. Again, 1945, 41.9 uh, people to one. 16.5 in 1950, 5.1 right at the beginning of the 60s, and then you can see it dropped from 3.7 to 1, 3.2 to 1, 3.4 to 1, and of course down, down to in the year 2010, it went under 3 for the first time at 2.9. This is just a little bit of the background and the history of human longevity and how it plays into the first idea that we use for it, which is Social Security. Think about it. If everybody's going to be living into their 80s and 90s, nobody predicted Social Security had to pay that long. If you look at the Social Security death master list and you see the number of people dying every year, it is precipitously smaller every year. Not maybe by a lot, but enough to say that somehow, some way, we're going to have to fix the Social Security system just on the basis of their mortality revolution. Keep in mind that people that are receiving their Social Security today at 62, 66, which is full retirement age for about half the baby boomers, and age 70 is the max, that number, that timeline is all going to be pushed up. It will not be surprising to me if we, to correct this that they move the new full retirement age to age 70, maybe the maximum benefit to age 75, and that you can't really touch Social Security until you're age 65 so it matches up with Medicare. Remember, whatever's happening with Social Security is going to be somewhat a kissing cousin event with with, with Medicare. Those two items are huge issues. Don't forget to watch our next segment on the mortality credits, the new alpha, part two of our series on the mortality revolution. And keep in mind, 
Before moving forward with any of the ideas on our show, always check with your tax consultant, legal counsel, or compliance officer. And don't forget to subscribe to my consumer show, Steve Savant's Money, the name of the game. Daily content that you can post on your website, social media accounts, and database distribution. I'm Steve Savant. Thanks for watching.